Many years ago, I attended uh, Spring Harvest when Delirious, uh, who were then known as Cutting Edge, you may um, not remember that name, but you may think of the name of Martin Smith, their lead singer, um, were leading the worship in the uh, youth theatre uh, at Spring Harvest that year. And something happened in that place as we were worshipping, um, which made me want more of God. The, the presence of God, the power of God filled that place in such a way that it impacted me more than I think I'd ever experienced before. And I knew that I wanted that deeper encounter uh, with God. And so when I came home, I went to see a, a couple of people in our church who were discipling me. Um, and they had a, a friend of theirs who was visiting from Wales. Um, and uh, we went into the dining room and they prayed with me um, and uh, to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And I was, and I began speaking in tongues. And that was a special and profound experience uh, in my Christian journey. Here in the passage today, we turn to uh, the account of Pentecost. And we're looking at Pentecost power for you uh, and I. You see, what happened then wasn't just for then, it was for now as well. What happened then on that very first Pentecost day wasn't just for the early church, for the church in the New Testament, but it was for the church today. That New Testament period we are still living in. The full uh, time of the New Testament hasn't come to, uh, hasn't come to an end yet. We're still waiting for the, some of the events uh, in Revelation uh, to happen. And so the power that was available then is still available today. The signs and wonders that happened then can still happen uh, today. The Holy Spirit's manifestation then still happens uh, today. So let's read Acts chapter 2 uh, verses uh, 1 to 4. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. What an amazing uh, thing that must have been to experience. The day of Pentecost was a Jewish feast held 50 days after Passover. It celebrated the first fruits uh, of the wheat harvest. And in the Jewish rituals of that time, the first sheaf reaped from the barley harvest was presented to God at Passover. But at Pentecost, the first fruits of the wheat harvest were presented to God. And so Pentecost is called the day of first fruits in Numbers 28 verse 26. Jewish tradition also taught um, that Pentecost marked the day when the law was given to Israel. The Jews sometimes called Pentecost Shimkath Torah or joy of the law. And when the day of Pentecost had fully come, as the scripture says, it was now 10 days after the time that Jesus had ascended into heaven in Acts chapter 1 and verse 3. And since Jesus commanded the disciples to wait for the coming of the Holy Spirit, they were gathered uh, in the uh, upper room, 12 of them uh, as disciples, but likely there were more people. And on the day of Pentecost itself, probably around 120 odd people were gathered together when suddenly the scripture says there came from heaven the sound as of a rushing and mighty wind. Now the association of sound or a rushing uh, a mighty wind filling the whole house with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is unusual. We don't hear of the Holy Spirit coming in the same audible way today. Well, that's certainly not been my experience, at least. But it probably has connection with the fact that in both the Hebrew and the Greek languages, the word for spirit, as in Holy Spirit, is the same word for breath or wind. Here, the sound from heaven, as the scripture says, was the sound of the Holy Spirit being poured out on the disciples and on the people there. And then something else amazing happens. As they look at each other, there, the scripture says, there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon on each of them. So these divided tongues as of fire appearing over each of them were also unusual. 
it probably should be connected with John the Baptist's prophecy because he said that Jesus would baptise with the Spirit and with fire, Matthew chapter 3, verse 11. And the idea behind the whole picture of uh, fire is usually purification. As a refiner uses fire to make pure gold, and fire burns away uh, the chaff, burns away the stuff that um, isn't, isn't wanted, burns away what is temporary, it will leave the stuff that will only last, the pure gold. This is an excellent illustration of the principle that the filling of the Holy Spirit is not just for abstract power, but for purity. And we'll come on and look at uh, holiness and purity in part five um, of this series in a few weeks' time. And then the scripture says, they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And these other tongues, as we will read in the next section of the passage, are actually different earthly languages. Sometimes the gift of tongues is a heavenly language, one where we pray and intercede with God, and it's a language that only he understands. We don't even understand it. Although sometimes people can be given um, uh, a gift of interpretation if there's a, a tongue, a prophetic word given in church. But um, very often when, when we're speaking in tongues, they are, um, or praying in tongues, it's a heavenly language that only God knows. Here in this uh, account here in Acts, we find that actually they are other earthly languages that are being spoken here. Languages that the disciples wouldn't have known, but God supernaturally gave them the ability to speak them. Let's read that. We're going to read Acts chapter 2, uh, verses 5 to 13. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. And when they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judah and Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt and other parts of Libya near Cyrene. Visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they came and asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk as you suppose. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. So here we see um, the Holy Spirit being outpoured um, and the effect that that has on other people who are around at that time. The scripture says that it was poured out on the disciples and on the other people who were there. Um, uh, so the other, the other 120 people were also there that were impacted by what happened. But there were lots of other people around at that time. The scripture says from every nation under heaven. Now that isn't we would understand the entire earth, but under the Roman world, as it was at that time. And these people are stunned to hear the disciples, the Galileans, speaking in these other languages. And it made them question what was going on. And some people mocked them. Some people said, oh, they've had too much wine. They likely heard these other languages, but thought it was a load of nonsense. They didn't understand it. They couldn't understand what was going on. And whenever there's a move of God, you will often have people who will doubt that move and who mock it and they don't believe what's happening. And if those people who are not Christians are mocking, then it's kind of understandable because they don't understand. They don't have the Holy Spirit to reveal to them what is going on. But if they are fellow Christians who are mocking, then it's, uh, it's sad. It brings sadness to God's heart because not all Christians are prepared to accept the moving of God's Holy Spirit today with signs and wonders. Some people feel, some Christians feel that the move of the Holy Spirit and the signs and wonders, all that sort of thing finished when the disciples, the apostles uh, died. That's not what scripture says, but that's what some people believe scripture to say. But don't let that put you off. If the Holy Spirit is moving through you, we're not called to please people, 
but to honour God through our lives in thought and word and action. Let's continue with the story, Acts chapter 2, verses uh, 15 to 21. So Peter says, no, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great coming and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So Peter now stands up and addresses the crowd. That The Holy Spirit has come upon the disciples. They're speaking these languages. People are hearing it and starting to question it. Some people are mocking. And Peter stands up to give a reason to explain to the people what is happening. And he addresses the crowd and, and bear in mind, this is the guy. Peter is the guy who had denied Jesus three times. You know, this is the guy, Peter, who puts his foot in his mouth a lot of the time. And yet Peter was reinstated, if you remember, at the breakfast encounter with Jesus in John 21, 15 to 19. It's a beautiful illustration that even when, even when we make up, uh, mess up and we make mistakes, uh, when we come to God in uh, seeking his forgiveness, he does forgive us, he does reinstate us, and he does um, bring us back into his family, into his fold. Not that we leave his family, but, you know, he, he restores us and, and builds us back and has amazing things for us um, as we come um, in uh, seeking his forgiveness. His move and his grace are just wonderful. And so Peter now speaks with boldness and authority in Luke chapter 12 and verse 12. It says, for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what to say. This boldness comes upon him. Why is it just because he feels bold up by what's going on? No, it's because the Holy Spirit is teaching him in that very hour what to say. The Holy Spirit is giving him the words. The Holy Spirit is stirring his heart in that time. When we need to speak, the Holy Spirit will teach us what to say. It will give us the ability and the boldness to proclaim whatever he wants us to say. After my accident in 2015, I was full of boldness to proclaim the truth of life uh, and death and the need for salvation at that time. And there was something in me that almost took over my human ability and spoke from uh, the spirit. I wasn't worried if people were offended. I just spoke the truth that people needed Jesus because nobody knows how short life can be. For me on that day, uh, life almost came to an end. By God's grace, uh, it didn't happen. But, but, uh, but we never know when our last breath will be. We never know how many days each of us has got before we are called home to heaven. And so I wanted to encourage people and say, you know, we all need Jesus in our lives. We all need to take that step of faith and ask for his forgiveness. So Peter then breaks down um, the story, it breaks down the, the prophecy rather that comes uh, from the, the book of Joel. You can go back into the Old Testament and read uh, what Peter says in the book of Joel. Um, but Peter breaks this down. So the first part says, and it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. The idea of the last days that Peter refers to that's in the book of Joel is that they are the times of the Messiah, or Jesus, okay, um, encompassing both his humble coming, his, his birth uh, and life on earth, and his return uh, in glory, which we call the second coming. Because Jesus had already come in humility uh, at Christmas time, his birth, the disciples were aware that his return in glory could come at any time and it still could be we've not yet seen that Jesus has not yet returned to take us to be with him uh, in heaven the next part says your sons and daughters shall prophesy prophecy is a gift that God gives to his people today again as I mentioned a few minutes ago some people believe that the prophecy isn't a gift anymore for today but that's not what scripture teaches prophecy is still a gift for his people today it's a gift that brings encouragement and it builds up the people of God. Then it says, your young men uh, shall see visions. 
Visions are things that people see in their mind's eye. Scripture reveals people who had visions. Daniel in the Old Testament was a, a one such person who saw visions and was able to interpret um, visions. These today bring visions today bring teaching, they bring encouragement and guidance to God's people. Then it says, Your old men shall dream dreams. The Bible doesn't reveal what constitutes an old man, neither did, does it constitute what is uh, it determines a young man either. Um, and it doesn't say, you know, how old a, an, an old man needs to be. But we're never too old for God to speak through us. And why dreams? Is it because as we get older, we sleep more, so more time for dreaming? I don't know, just a thought there. And then the prophecy goes on. It says, and on my men servants and my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they shall prophesy. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit was only revealed to certain people for certain times for certain activities but now under the new covenant the holy spirit is available to all young and old men and women children and young people all can be empowered by his holy spirit and that's an encouragement for you and me today we live under the new covenant in new testament times in new covenant times and the Holy Spirit is as much for us as it was for the disciples back then on the day of Pentecost. And then the prophecy moves on and it says, I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath. Blood and fire and vapour and smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. Now these, these words are referring to the culmination of things. The judgment on earth before uh, Jesus' second coming. And depending on your view of end times or eschatology, that's the study of the end times, I would suggest to you that you and I are not around for this. Uh, the church, Jesus' people, will be raptured and taken to heaven before God's judgment is poured out on earth. I haven't got time this morning to go into why I believe that happens. I believe that's what scripture teaches. Um, but as we look through scripture, there are times where when God pours his judgment out uh, on the people uh, who, who, who are rebelling against him, he takes his people uh, out of the way. If you want a, a quick example, uh, think about Abraham and Lot uh, escaping Sodom and Gomorrah before God pours out his judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah. And then it says, and it shall come to pass that whoever, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Peter's closing words of this in this prophetic word that he quotes uh, from the prophet Joel end with this great message of hope that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Jews and Gentiles, you and me, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. saved. Nothing that we have done is so bad that we cannot uh, be saved, that we cannot be forgiven. So how do we apply this to our lives today? Briefly, the encouragement and the lessons that I think the scripture is saying to us this morning is that the power that was given to the disciples at Pentecost is available to us in exactly the same way today. But there are three things I want to reiterate. Firstly, that they were all with one accord. That's what the scripture says. The people there at that time on that day when the Holy Spirit was poured out were all with one accord. In other words, they were gathered together and they shared the same heart, the same love for God the same trust in his promises and the same geography. There was unity. Unity is essential for the Holy Spirit to be manifest. Does that mean unity in everything in scripture or does it mean unity in the core principles, the core elements of our faith? Now people would differ on that. I think it's important that we work towards unity in all of scripture. But certainly to start with, we must have unity on those core things, things like the divinity of Jesus, the truth and message of the gospel, the cross, etc. One of the main things the devil wants to do in families, and the church is, is a family, we are family, is to bring disunity or to break down relationships or harmony. So we need to be vigilant for ourselves and for each other to see when he's trying to attack us. And the Holy Spirit will help us in that. If we ask the Holy Spirit, he will help us to be aware, to have wisdom and discernment, to see when the devil is trying to attack, to try and divide 
and bring disunity in the church so we can prevent that, we can pray against that and we can ask for God's help to stop that happening. Secondly, before we can be filled with the Holy Spirit, we must recognise our own emptiness. By gathering together for prayer in obedience, these disciples did just that. They recognised they didn't have the resources in themselves to do what the, the God had told them they were going to do, what Jesus told them they were going to do at the Great Commission. They had to rely on the power of God. See, humility is key to be filled with the Holy Spirit, recognising we cannot do things by ourselves, that we don't have the ability in ourselves, that the work of God can't be achieved by our own skills, our own strength, our own understanding, that we need God's strength, God's understanding, God's wisdom to achieve what God has for us to do. His plans are so great that if we try and do them by ourselves, we will only fail. We need his supernatural and divine power to empower us through his Holy Spirit to do the things that he's called us to do. And thirdly, that the Holy Spirit comes on them as with tongues of fire. Fire represents purity. So do you ask God to purify your lives? It's something King David asked um, God a lot of in the Psalms. Do you ask God to purify your lives? If you do, you're in good company. David said in Psalm 51.10, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. I personally pray that um, a lot. The Holy Spirit doesn't leave us when we sin, okay? We need to be aware of that. It doesn't leave us when we sin. If he did, where would any of us be? But whilst we are saved from the curse of sin and death, we are still capable of sinning. But we also know that the Bible says if we confess our sin, he is gracious to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And even when we live with continual sin, i.e. deliberately and consistently sinning as a way of life, God is sovereign and God still moves in power through us. But that's not an excuse to carry on living in that willful place of sin. We can't think, well, I know I'm sinning, but it's all right, God's still working through me. No, that doesn't, that doesn't cut, that doesn't wash, okay? He calls us, God calls us to die to the sinful desires of our hearts and to live a life that honours and glorifies him. So in conclusion, do you want that power today? Do you want the Holy Spirit's power today moving in your life as the disciples did at that day of Pentecost and in the way they saw the Holy Spirit's power being manifest through them as we go through the rest of the book of Acts in the New Testament. Have you been baptised with the Holy Spirit? If not, ask. Ask Jesus. Pray and seek him. Ask someone to pray with you. And if you don't get the gift of tongues, that doesn't mean you're, you've not been baptised with the Holy Spirit. It doesn't mean you're some less of a Christian uh, in that way. It's one of the many gifts that God has for us and, to, and, and gives to us. And sometimes... In, in some parts of the world, some, some Christians believe it's, it's a mark of how, uh, whether you're a Christian or not, if you can speak in tongues. That's not what the Bible teaches, okay? But don't be afraid to make mistakes. Don't be afraid uh, to get it wrong. Sometimes we're so fearful of getting things wrong that we think, well, I'm not, I'm not going to step out in faith. I'm not going to try and, and ask God for this, that or the other because I might mess up, I might make a mistake. You know, we learn by making mistakes, don't we? That's how we learn. And God understands that. So reach out to him in faith. Pray. Ask him to be empowered with his Holy Spirit. Ask him to reveal to you the gifts that he has for you. The Holy Spirit's power was for the disciples and the people then in Acts 2. And it is also for us today to be a power that draws people to Jesus and to his love for them. Let's pray. Father, we just want to thank you for your Holy Spirit's power. We thank you for the way that it empowered people 
uh, through the Old Testament. We thank you for the way that it was poured out on the disciples on the day of Pentecost and that now it is not just for certain people for certain times, it's for anybody who asks. Father, we just ask that now you will pour out your Holy Spirit on us here today. Holy Spirit, just fill us with the gifts that you have got for us, those gifts that we will fan into flame as we work on them, as we practice them. Father, just fill us with the gift, we pray, of speaking in tongues. Fill us with the gift of prophecy. Fill us, Father, with the ability of dreaming dreams. Father, fill us with the things that um, you said through your prophet Joel um, that we would see in these last days. Father, we want to honour you. We want to glorify you with our lives. We will ask, uh, Father, that you will purify us as fire purifies and refines gold, that you will purify our hearts, purify our lives so that we can live lives that are honourable for you to do the things that you've called us to do, to do the work that you've called us and empowered us to do. And Father, that you will use us to reach out and witness to those who don't yet know you as their Lord and Saviour, that you love people, that you want to rescue them from their sin, and that you have a wonderful plan and purpose for their lives. Father, just bless us this day. Fill us with your spirit in Jesus' name.